Dear friends, I'm glad to see you all at Fagin Life. It's Tuesday, 7th of June, 10 p.m. And we're glad to see you here at our Day 104 stream with Alexei Rostovich. Alexei, glad to see you here as well. Likewise, as always, ask you to subscribe to Fagin Live and to Alexei Rostovich. If you're watching that in English, subscribe to the private here station. We've got about 70,000 people watching us live. Yesterday we had a stream that appeared to be that uh, Russian activities do seem to have some force behind them and Russian uh, attack potential still exists or did it somewhat deflate overnight? Well, um, things don't change that quickly on the front. Sometimes they do, but usually it takes time. So, I guess somebody was listening to our show yesterday. And they've been hitting a lot of things last night. Uh, last night, Ukraine artillery was firing throughout the front from Papasny and Lysychansk all the way down to Zaporozhye and they hit quite a few targets, quite a few good targets and I think they somewhat deflated the attack capabilities of the Russian troops. What is interesting that earlier Russian troops did not mind much if they were hit. They actually would still go and attack if they have an order. But today, they, in some places, they actually withdrew. They literally pulled back. And yet they still shelled some of our positions, like near Kharkov. They still managed to shoot at the city. And perhaps that is an indicator that they did not store enough reserves to continue this offensive. So perhaps today's somewhat of a slow development is a factor that they're regrouping and getting a bit more reserves, what they have available, maybe from DNR, LNR, and they'll try to cut Lysychansk off. But as of today, they've been standing still, basic tactical motions and some artillery backfire, but nothing major. What is in Severodonetsk? Uh, we get all kinds of different messages every day. Well, that's the thing. It is changing there very rapidly. It can change about four or five hours. Uh, and if we have four or five speakers speaking throughout the day, each of them may have a bit different picture. So, totally Severodonetsk is not captured by Russians. No, it is not. We withdrew a little, and they do work a little bit with aviation and artillery. Their aviation is rather careful. It is somewhat skittish of our anti air defense, and also they don't want to hit their own troops, so they're uh, tactically attacking certain positions, and we're still keeping part of a city. I'm curious to see what unfolds tomorrow, because there is potential on their side, but for some reason it is not being utilized. Perhaps they want to destroy our artillery first, or try to. Maybe there is somebody more accurate in the command who wants to try to destroy artillery and is somewhat reluctant to just waste the current troops they have or knows that they won't get resupplies soon enough. 
There was a bit of tactical move. They tried to get Kamushevaka. This is to the south of Lysychansk. And they tried to attack the fortified region there. And in a couple other places in Zaporozhye. If we go down south, there was some tactical motion there and got their ass handled to them from our artillery. And in Kherson, our artillery got them as well. So, literally, it's been a day of the artillery fighting today. Not much of a other action on the front. And Kherson, what is happening there? Similar, we hit them with our artillery, they tried to hit us with theirs. There were some beautiful explosions on their side, so it is an artillery day today. Is there any movement of Ukraine troops? No, there is none. Our troops are not advancing near Kherson anywhere further because Russia reinforced their position and they somewhat slowed our offensive aspirations there. We cannot say that uh, they completely stopped it, but yeah, our motion is minimal. So before getting to close quarter fighting, today is an artillery day. They are shelling each other. All right, then let's address other matters that we have on the list. First, regarding Kherson, Zaporozhye, uh, related to grains and food stocks there. I understand that one of the collaborationists, uh, I f cannot find his last name, Stremos, Simo, Stremos, that they've been taking the grain from Ukraine reserves and the ones they captured and they're sending it happily to Crimea. I'd like you to comment on the situation with grain and about that grain robbery. How is it being seen on the Bankova Street in Kiev on the President's address? Can they leave Ukraine without food? Well, you know, there are the guys whom you can expect to do whatever. They don't really have any limits. Um, they are trying to connect Kherson to their territories, and they have got some of the talking collaborationist heads there in Melitopol, Kherson, and that they want to join Mother Russia. They are looking at the bright statements of Turkey and Russian Federation. And and our presidential side did mention today that there is no way they can annex these territories with any approval from Ukraine. All these conversations about food crisis is basically an attempt to affect Ukrainian food manufacturers who are the main competitors to Russian manufacturers. And if they can capture something and sell it on the world market, yeah, they, they would definitely be doing it. Yes, I can totally see them doing it, stealing and selling. And one thing is Putin, then the second thing, the other thing is the FSB generals steal something, cut it off and take it away and resell someplace. Um, Turks, Turkish government said today that they would buy Ukrainian grain, but uh, they would buy it at, with a 25% discount. So maybe that's their fee for participation in this conflict. So Zelensky did state today that about 2,500 of Azov Steel uh, defenders are prisoners of war currently. Can we discuss it? Um, I don't see what can we discuss there. If there are any branches, any angles that we should take a look at. 
Is there any negotiation process going to rescue them? Well, we do have a task to free them all, all of them, including any other military personnel that by chance ended up in Russian prison. So, General Budanov is the head of the commission for the return of the prisoners of war so that he would uh, have concentrated power in his hands and it would uh, be a shorter signal between him and the president so he can communicate our asks so what do you think Moscow will blackmail you with that uh, what can you say about blackmail here there is the blackmail opportunities are limited because we do have their prisoners of war as well they have ours we have theirs plus there are certain guarantees of the international community that uh, Russia promised to honor oh you do trust Russia anything that they promise well you know it's if you treat it this way then we might as well just say that they'll kill everybody in prison and there's nothing to talk about okay okay I take a few steps back because uh, yeah I don't think they'll go that far um, so we are working and also Russian side did mention that we exchanged the bodies of some of the defenders that uh, we collected from the fields and they did too so at least that the and that means that it's work in progress even that is uh, even the body exchange is still an important exchange for the relatives so at least they confirmed that they agreed to the body exchange there was a statement today on the from the British side that two British combatants who were probably volunteers in Ukraine forces um, they got captured and it seems that they are going through trial in DNR uh, which is a laughable court and there is a notion that they actually there is a there is a risk of uh, death sentence for these two I would say that all these courts all these monkey courts and DNR and LNR is just an attempt to raise the price for the hostages it probably is something like if you really really ask us hard we might consider freeing them but since the will of the people was expressed it is more difficult and we need to appease the public sentiment and the cost of exchange for these two people is likely to be higher so that's uh, freaking amazing yeah that's how they work this is this actually does have a an official name it's qualified as taking hostages it just proves once again that Russian Federation under Putin is a terrorist state of course no questions there the question is probably how to resolve it that's my main question and it's it's a question to Ukraine presidents Ukraine administration because these two guys were fighting for us and uh, we take responsibility for trying to take the, get them out of uh, Russian prison any news from Medvedchuk is he continuing to spill anything you know if he does we'll hear news from as you Intel and does he is he even talking well where would, how would I know well if if he would be talking would you know perhaps you have contacts well I can say that unofficially yes people are saying that he is talking he is sharing information but this is unofficial so I cannot elaborate on that but do you think he can say a lot oh yeah I think he can and do you think he's crumbling he's uh, talking now well it's hard to tell uh, this is rumors and frankly perhaps 
But he did know a lot. Mark, why are you talking about him in a past tense? He is still alive, or so they say. Um, well, I think he is in good shape, but I also heard he did replant some of the hair from other body parts on his head before you guys captured him, so please brush him, because he might not look too decent. Uh, jokes aside, please subscribe to our channels, uh, share the links, especially if you have friends in Russia or if you're watching that in English, if you have friends in the United States and Europe, please share links to this cast in English. And also subscribe to Fagin Life and to the channel of Alexei Aristovich. Uh, his name in the description of that video. All right, going further, his last interview. After that, there were several... I'm talking about Putin now. There were several statements with new threats that, if anything, they will attack the centers of decision-making. Lavrov, uh, that small one, uh, Medvedev, all of them. Do you think their statements have any meaning for on the European delays of support, or do, do they not? Yeah, I don't think these threats affect resupply efforts, even if we're speaking of Germans, maybe three people like Schultz and a couple from his immediate surrounding are slowing down the help because they have other reasons, not because Putin threats, but perhaps other things that they want to maintain certain business schemes and partnership relations and maintain certain peace in Europe because, you know, Putin promised that he will not attack anything after he grabs a piece of Ukraine. And he even claimed today that he warned everyone about possible war, but nobody believed him. I think the power of Europe is that it does not quite need contact with reality. This is a weird society and a great achievement, actually, that they do not quite need to contact reality. Unlike them, you and me do have to contact reality and monitor the events to basically stay alive. Uh, European politicians, they have a privilege of not contacting reality. They don't care about Putin, Bucha, Mariupol and other places, and they live in a mode that uh, is egocentric and is aimed at bringing everything back into the place where it was before the war. This is a big civilizational achievement. However, while it is a reason for pride, Poles and Ukrainians did sign a contract today for a hundred million dollars, six hundred million dollars, and we're getting a number of uh, South Korean howitzers that are being made in Poland, not American, they're Polish and South Korean, uh, very modern, very nice uh, equipment. When we get 54 of them here to the front, that'll be a very good story. Problem is, it'll likely take several months for that number to arrive. They just don't have this quantity on hand, so they have to manufacture that. And what about Lend-Lease? Uh, there is a bit less of attention on it. Is it still working? I can give you a couple examples. Uh, several self-propelled howitzers M109. They're American. They came from Norway, but they're American-made, and they've been shooting on the front for a couple two weeks for a couple weeks already. And what it means is that, by analogy, we can think that 
if something is shooting on the front, it likely is shooting for the last two weeks. And it could be a similar picture with uh, the rest of this arm support. In any case, all of the targets that our artillery shelled from Kherson to Kharkov, including that corridor be, uh, between uh, Izium and Papasny, something or th they do, we do have some ammo for our artillery. So they're not shooting the last of that. They actually have a good reinforcement. As for land lease, we did talk about it a couple of days ago, so there were some news. And we'll, we can address it tomorrow again in more details. So Wednesday is uh, 15th next week. It'll be a meeting, uh, Rammstein 3, where all the ally countries will be gathering together. And there probably will be some news about new supplies, because these things do not happen just because. They usually come planned. And if they shipped a lot of these things by transport cargo, it does take several weeks to get here, 10 to 12 days to cross Atlantic, get unloaded in ports of Europe, and they, by truck or by rail car, they go through the border of Europe and can rename itself. And uh, I think that at the early decade of June, we'll see the first really strong, good indicators of uh, new equipment on the front. The ones that will be understandable even for my uh, beloved housewives, who are not experts in warfare. So you did mention in one of the interviews, and I'll quote you here, that in order to counterattack and deoccupy territory, we need, uh, say, 60 anti-air force guns, but they'll give us six. Where are the rest? It does reflect the overall picture of what's happening from the dynamic standpoint when they arrive and when they become available. But your position is a bit concerned. Yeah, I'm an old military dude who is also skeptical, so I'm not going to believe things, even if they do look legit. I don't know how many of those MLRS systems they will supply to us. I just hope that there'll be not two, three, four, because they don't change the situation. You see what's the problem of all these conversations about counterattack and land lease that everybody wants to discuss it? Uh, but people who love more to talk about counterattack than even talking about and throwing shit about me and you. We don't know the real volumes and real quantities that are being sent. So any attempt to prognosticate on this kind of gets hung in the air. I understand generally what can be said and uh, sometimes I know the approximation of what likely will arrive, but among the publicly open information, very often we do not have this luxury to know the data. And our people who are watching us, they, from what I can understand, they're, they, they're seeing that there are a lot of concerns that there is a lot of conversation about this equipment, and yet it is not on the front yet. And there is always the, also the conversation about some of the Ukraine troops getting ready, uh, prepping to use these uh, pieces of equipment, and then uh, being thrown into the grinder on the front. And that story with that cadence is kind of putting a lot of people down. The, I, that's why I wrote today, I actually made a point on that. You can, we likely will be waiting for a long time. This is not a fast-paced, fast operation. We need to 
become that God's grinder that will be grinding away Russian troops. We need people who can run marathon, not sprint. People who would be ready for certain supplies coming in the immediate vicinity uh, next week or so, certain supplies coming maybe two or three weeks later. But we do need people who have a capacity to grind through enemy and do not freak out and continue uh, being a bit. Well, the mood, of course, can change because that's the situation, but the intent has to be very precise and sharp, just like that iron that will stick up Putin's butt when we're done fighting it. And everybody needs to realize that and support Ukraine military that they are working to grind the uh, enemy's forces that are exceedingly concentrated on certain directions than we are. And it is just impossible to grind through them quickly. We are doing it step by step with the help of the West and their new equipment. But when we grind them to below 51%, that would be interesting for us do we continue some support of land lease and take back certain territories or do we go outright and capture everything back that was stolen from us? But anyway, there, there, this fighting was still yet to commence and we'll likely at some point will go for a counter-offensive, but it is a function of how soon do we get that German equipment. And the way I see that, I'm a careful optimist. I think it'll arrive. We shall accumulate it by at least August in certain volume. And we'll see some counterattack push by Ukraine forces. Because even now we already have, without land lease, we have troops capable of freeing Kharkov and Kherson. And we'll get to the point where it will be very difficult position for them instead of the other way around, near Lysychansk and that area. So, hence our conversations will often have a degree of a abstract discussion, because without knowing the exact numbers, it is impossible to give precise and accurate prognose. Uh, but I do understand in general numbers that are coming still, you know, until they're here, it's a bit pointless to discuss the exact numbers. And when we have proper tools on the front, we'll be able to grind their forces to the painful circumstances for Kremlin occupants. And as I said, we cannot lose technically, because otherwise it will become one big collective butcher for the whole Ukraine. So we need to win, and we will. By November, by next year, by April of next year, by June next year, it doesn't matter, we shall win. And all that why, when, how, any news, fresh news, trust me, there will be news, there will be amazing news, one of all go into counter-offensive. There'll be a lot of that and it'll be hard for us with Mark to discuss that. Ah, we'll manage, we'll manage, Alexei. Okay, so more questions. We do have 416,000 people watching us live. We definitely have more people joining us now. I wonder if it's some sort of therapeutic effect for those who are coming to watch us later. Um, Mariupol. There is some information from mayor of Mariupol, Ukrainian mayor, that there could be an epidemic of cholera related to a huge number of decaying bodies that are buried in the city or not even buried and just 
decaying under the rubble. And that leads to a very difficult situation within the city. If you've seen, you cannot really leave the city limits to either Ukraine or Russia. And they give certain permits to go from one area of the city to another. There's housewives papers. Yeah, they did announce that there is a risk of cholera. There have been some cases already. Um, it is a difficult situation. Is there any way to get people from there by any corridor or anything else? Or Russia is not letting, not permitting citizens to leave cities? So, from Kherson and Mariupol used to be going to Ukraine through Zaporozhye, through actually that Vasilivka, where Russia has an aggregation of uh, military troops. So, it's a zone of active fighting. I do not even imagine, I can't imagine how one can leave the city under this circumstance, especially that Russian troops are doing all they can to prevent this from happening. I would not even discuss the roads and routes people are using because, again, if I mention that, they likely will be no more because Russia will try to close it. And what if somebody thinks about Crimea, to go through Crimea to Ukraine? Somehow, eventually, uh, he can travel with God because if he needs to go, sure. And then you can go to... How, how do you even go like this? Well, you go through Crimea to Russia. From Russia you can go to either Belarus or Baltic countries and then go to Ukraine. And it is force major. Some circumstances make it real difficult, but we understand that people try to. So... Um, other things, other questions I get in the mail that and usually more people are inquiring about the refugees now. Um, I would just say refugees, do not be afraid. Go through any way you can, any route you can, any route you can find, even through the enemy territory to go back to Ukraine and join us here. All right, so the next question is about borders. That's one of the main questions I also get from the chat. We did address that in Ukraine the borders are closed and there are certain categories and professions that have no capability of leaving the country. Did the situation change? Uh, yes, it is uh, under a very heavy critique and discussion right now. So it likely will be better to speak about that post factum after it is agreed uh, upon. Um, I think we found some common ground and uh, we are working to prepare next steps. So is what is the reason for that? Is it because of the conscripts and extra money? Or do you think it's contracts, mobilization contracts that give people money and they go fighting because they like money? Well, it's, it's a summary of different factors. Some people are there to make a buck, but on our side, we don't even conscribe certain people because we don't have enough weapons for them. So those people who are working abroad could be programmers, they could be sailors, they're actually supporting their families and supporting our economy. And there are some pretty impressive numbers from the salaries and money they make while working overseas. Again, why should we hold these people? The um, question is who will pay for all that, and we understand that the West is supporting us on the macro level, but there is a big question, how long will that continue? So these days, if the head of the family, um, uh, 
related to the shipping industry can actually go out in the ocean, earn money and come back home and support his family. That is a good thing. I understand that the first days of war were different. There was a question about survival of the country. We still have it, but it's a bit more stretched phase of the conflict. But back then, that was difficult for everybody to understand what's happening. So I understand the borders were closed for a few days, a couple of weeks. But right now, I don't see enough reasoning behind it. And some people are blaming it on uh, military centers that help us to acquire new fighters. But imagine, they're never been prepared for such a volume of people going through them. And I understand the frustration of some people. And I understand that this problem can also be taken off by differentiated approach to the mobilization. It still is important to pace it and make good decisions. It should be a differentiated approach because if somebody can support the country economically from afar and his family and we currently are not hiring or cannot recruit more, I don't see a reason for holding them. All right. It's closer to 450 watching us. I suggest we do not continue dragging the conversation today, since there are not too many events happening. We did touch upon certain things that need addressing, but we can uh, talk about the other events later tomorrow. And we do have events daily to discuss. Even though people are screaming, some of them, please do not go, there is more stuff to discuss, but we'll come back. Well, we're coming back every day. And by the way, when there is no actionable news from the front, we can discuss uh, higher level observations. So there is always something to address here. I do want to say that, especially for the Russian viewers, that our fight is righteous, enemy will be destroyed, the victory will be ours. Yeah, I remember who said that. That's uh, interesting point. So come tomorrow. Please subscribe to both channels. I'm still missing about 3000 for 1.5 million. And of course, subscribe to Alexei. He's already got more people than I do. Uh, share this cast, the stream and your likes. Thank you. Love everybody. See you tomorrow.